When we moved into our apartment on Sycamore Street, we couldn't figure out why the former tenants had left. Our unit had the best view in the building. Our balcony overlooks a strip of forest, where deer can sometimes be seen roaming. The woods extend up to an escarpment, and white stone cliffs can be seen beyond the trees. There is a cul-de-sac to the left of the forest, which dead ends at a path, leading into a large park filled with green space. Every year, the town has a fireworks display in the park, and our balcony has an ideal vantage point for the display, much to the dismay of our cats, who cower beneath the sofa during the festivities. But despite the stunning views afforded by our balcony, I've discovered another sight. This one not nearly as pleasant as the forest and the fireworks and the cliffs in the distance. Much like the fireworks display in the park, something else happens once a year in this neighborhood, down in the little cul-de-sac off Sycamore Street. I just happened to notice it one night completely by accident. Since I work the night shift, I'm often awake at 3 a.m. on my days off, and sometimes even later than that. I heard once that 3 a.m. is the witching hour, whatever that means. It was just around that time, and I was getting ready to go to bed when I glanced out the window to take in a view before going to sleep. What I saw down there on Sycamore Street unnerved me. It gave me nightmares and made me mark the date in my phone when it had happened, as if to confirm to my future self that it wasn't just a nightmare. I looked down onto the street below and took in every detail. For several long seconds, I couldn't breathe. There were people down below on the street carrying torches, walking past in pairs. They had long red cloaks which hung from their shoulders like capes. Hoods of the same crimson color shrouded their faces in darkness. I watched as the pairs of people holding torches went along and tried to think of possible reasons for this behavior. Was this a late night prayer service for some obscure sect of Catholicism or an Orthodox religion of some kind? The pairs walked slowly in a procession down the center of the street, ignoring the sidewalk. They turned left onto the court and marched to the very end of the cul-de-sac. They made a ring of flames around its perimeter. A circle of people stood at the end of the street, holding their torches and staring blankly into the center of the road. Another person began to draw with the soot of their torch on the asphalt, making a large black symbol in the midst of them all. Then they started to chant and sway rhythmically, moving in hypnotizing circles around the dark symbol. I couldn't see much from the window, so I opened the door to my balcony as quietly as I could and stepped out into the night air. It was hard to see anything except for the robes and the flickering candles, but I could hear their chanting voices rising in volume. A moment later they began to move again, marching in procession into the house at the very end of the cul-de-sac. After they went inside, they didn't come back out. I stayed up for hours observing the home, until the sun rose and my wife came out asking what was wrong. Uh, nothing, just uh, admiring the view. Why are you staring at that house? It's creepy. Go to bed already, it's 9am, have you been awake all night? I thought about telling her what I'd seen, but couldn't quite bring myself to do it. 
I was worried she would think I was losing my mind. It certainly didn't sound like something that would happen in this quaint little town we'd moved to. It all seemed like something out of a horror movie. I went to bed and tried to forget about it. I couldn't. And when I woke up and walked down the street later on, whatever symbol had been drawn on the pavement was gone. As if it had never existed. Over the next year, I couldn't help but recall what I'd seen again and again. I didn't tell anyone, but I looked at that date reminder on my phone regularly. I also checked online to see if there was some religious significance to that specific day of the year, but could find nothing aside from the fact that May 16th is apparently National Sea Monkey Day, Nickel Day, and Supply Chain Professionals Day. And none of those seemed to explain what I'd witnessed. It was gnawing at me all year, and as the date approached my calendar again, I couldn't help but wonder if what I had witnessed was a yearly event. It reminded me of a druidic or pagan ritual. I thought maybe it would occur again on the same day the following year. And if a better look at the symbol might explain anything. I wondered if I could see anything by getting a bit closer. And I decided to try. So, after a year of waiting, I went into the forest, behind the cul-de-sac, and hid. Wearing all black clothing and a ski mask, for good measure. Probably looked like a criminal, casing a house for burglary, but I didn't care. I just needed to see what was going on. What was really happening on Sycamore Street. I stood out there in the forest, watching quietly as the street remained empty. Afraid someone might see me if I did anything. I remained motionless and resisted the temptation to check the time on my phone. The moon was pink and ominous, hanging bloated in the sky above. A rare, total lunar eclipse had occurred around midnight, and the sky looked faintly purple, and the neighborhood was bathed in an eerie vermilion glow. After a long period of waiting, I almost began heading home. Then, just as I was about to leave, I heard voices rising up into the night air. A low, humming chant. And flickering torches bobbing up and down could be seen emerging from behind the houses adjacent to the forest. A procession of robed, hooded figures made their way to the end of the cul-de-sac then made a ring around the end of the road, much the same way they had 365 days prior. Only now I was much closer and I could almost overhear what they were saying. I decided to creep a little closer, moving as quietly as I could through the forest, being careful not to step on any twigs or branches which would signal my location. A figure was drawing a symbol in the center of the road again, scraping the burnt torch's end across the pavement, leaving a black mark behind. The others in the group hummed and chanted rhythmically, moving in slow circles around him. Someone was leading a young woman dressed in white towards the center of the ring. Who are these people? I whispered to myself so quietly I could barely hear it, and yet they seemed to hear it very well. One of the hooded figures, who was much taller than the others, spun around and signaled in my direction, whispering something to the others. I was completely terrified when I saw several of them go down on all four like animals, dropping their torches and scurrying off into the darkness like dogs sent to track a fresh quarry. They moved with inhuman speed, their cloaks fluttering in the wind behind them as they raced into the woods, heading straight for me. My heart skipped a beat, and my breath caught in my throat as I froze, momentarily stunned into inaction. 
After what felt like hours, I managed to convince my legs to move and began to run, no longer caring about the sounds my feet made or the keys jingling in my pocket. My apartment was not far, only a hundred yards or so. But those things were fast, and they had gotten a large head start. As I ran, my skin was scraped by passing thorn bushes. I plowed through shrubbery, leaping over logs and fallen trees, tripping to the ground and stumbling back to my feet, too terrified to look back. With only a few steps to go until I reached the parking lot, something grabbed me roughly from behind. I was dragged, screaming through the forest by something stronger than any man. I was pulled towards the ceremony, still in progress. Whatever was holding me was powerful, its hands wrinkled with age and its face shrouded in darkness. Large black talons protruded from the ends of his fingers, and I wondered if this thing had once been a man, and if so, what was it now? You were not meant to witness this event, a hooded figure said once I'd been dragged into the roadway. You have not been initiated yet. It was a woman speaking. She was the tallest among the group, her crimson robes fringed with gold. As she spoke, she produced a long, curved knife from the folds of her robes. Give me your hand. I couldn't move. I didn't want to move. The knife looked very sharp. She nodded ever so slightly to the robed figures on either side of me, and they grabbed my hand, holding it out in front of me as I screamed. My mouth was quickly covered by a strong hand, and the woman began to carve something into my palm, blood welling up in the incision until it was made a pool of red which she had to mop away so she could finish. All the while, my screaming was muffled by the men around me, holding me tightly. Horrendous pain jolted through me all the way up my arm as she dug the point of the knife into my flesh and worked slowly to finish the symbol. When it was done, she closed my fist tightly, allowing the blood to drip down onto the asphalt of the street. I looked to see the symbol drawn in charcoal, now highlighted with shades of red from my blood. It was an enormous millipede wrapped around the center of the earth. The ground began to tremble and shake beneath our feet like an earthquake. Everyone around me stayed still, but I was terrified and tried to run. The pavement cracked beneath me and I tried to move away, but the acolytes of this strange secret society held me tightly to prevent me from fleeing. Bear witness. You are now one with us. Behold. The many-legged guy. The woman screamed, the earth breaking open beneath her to reveal a black chasm of unfathomable depths. Let me go, I cried out, biting the hand of the man who was muffling my screams for help. I kicked his shin, elbowing and thrashing and trying to get away. I don't want to be any part of this. They all gasped as a huge insectile face began to appear from beneath the cracked pavement from within the dark abyss. No, you can't be allowed to speak. Silence, you'll ruin everything, the woman cried. He mustn't refuse. But it was too late. Whatever was meant to happen was no longer going to happen as they planned. I guess that I was meant to be a sacrifice for this huge millipede which they worshipped as a deity. But that I needed to go willingly. Or at the very least, silently. Now the beast was furious at their insolence. Choose me. I will be the sacrifice. One of the acolytes called out. I will do it willingly. The massive millipede emerged from beneath the ground, appearing to be the size of a subway train, and then a freight train. 
but it never ended as it continued to grow in size, each lumpy section of midnight black thorax driven by a huge, disgusting set of hairy legs. Its freakish body repeated it over and over as it climbed out from the dark abyss, its mandibles clicking loudly as it eyed the figures and robes bowing down in the street. Despite its size, it moved quickly, snapping the head off one of the men and sending a fountain of blood into the air, consumed the rest of his body in one bite, gnashed its teeth and chittered with hunger, and the rest of them began to scream, realizing the ceremony to appease it had failed. Elbowing the other road figure holding me, I managed to break away from the group, running from their midst. I felt a few hands reaching out to grab me, their fingernails digging into my skin and leaving long, bloody marks on my forearms. But I got away, slipping away madly from them, with a berserk fit of fight or flight that I hadn't known myself capable of. Looking back over my shoulder, I saw the rob robed figures being tossed into the air like rag dolls, and landing in the mouth of the huge, many-legged worm. Cars were upended and driveways caved into the abyss. A huge crack followed me as I ran, the pavement splitting wider from the girth of the ever-emerging millipede. Once back inside my apartment, I locked the door in every way possible, barricading it with a chair for good me measure. I pulled the curtains closed, afraid to look outside. Afraid the worm would consume the world. This morning, the local news reported the event as a sinkhole. Nothing was mentioned about anyone going missing, or being injured or eaten alive by giant millipedes. No deaths were reported, no national or international coverage was done despite the scale of the disaster. As if everyone in town knew to say nothing, even to the media. It was as if the whole thing had never happened aside from the gaping hole in the ground at the end of the road. What the hell is going on out there? My wife asked groggily, pulling up the shades and gawking out the window. She gasped at the sight of our neighborhood in rubble. A sinkhole, I told her. A very, very large sinkhole. At least according to the news. It's, uh, it's amazing what can be hiding beneath us just under the surface. Just a gaping hole waiting to swallow us all up. Don't be so grim. Yeah, so much for our nice view. I'm gonna be doing construction out there for weeks now. I gently pulled the blinds up again. My hands shaking with fear. Couldn't help but feel as if the road crew out there was watching us. Looking up at us from the scene of destruction. They looked angry. They looked afraid. Whatever that ceremony was, I don't think it was meant to be interrupted. <laughs>